Sure. Good morning. This is, I'm Allison Asher Weber with the EdTech Center at World Education, the Director of Strategic Initiatives, and thrilled every day to get to work with Jamie and the rest of our colleagues and friends it's across mutual. the country <laughs> and internationally. <It's> <laughs> Thank you, Allison. Uh, my name is Jamie Harris. If you miss me at the top of the hour, I am a Digital Skills Senior Technical Advisor for the EdTech Center at World Ed. And Allison and I get the joy of sharing about top instructional strategies for digital resilience. Um, we'll give you a little background first. You've probably been hearing about the DRAW project, the DRAW project, and it means digital resilience in the American workforce. And it's an initiative from JFF and World Ed with support of the Office of Career, Technical and Adult Education, also known as OCTE. Um, this initiative is to better prepare adult education practitioners who support learners that struggle to fully engage in tasks that demand the use of digital technologies. The aim through this project and initiative is to support professional development that enables teachers to be strategic and learner focused. Also to support adult education programs in designing effective, flexible technology enabled education and support also to provide state adult education and family literacy act funders and their pd providers with models guidance and resources for supporting funded programs as they sustain and expand digital lit literacy efforts through draw we will provide the field with flexible evidence-based and piloted strategies and materials to help teachers i love that help teachers build the digital literacy skills and digital resilience of adult learners how can we support our teachers draw is um, this initiative helps us do that um, these efforts will help to ensure adult learners can obtain the digital knowledge and skills necessary for post-secondary education training employment civic engagement self-sufficiency life academia everywhere where digital skills are required so if you haven't seen our page, there is a draw page and we invite you to visit it. Um, on the page, there's a little bit of a timeline. And in the fall of 2021, we did a landscape scan. You probably saw many requests to fill out a questionnaire so that we can get information from the field. Currently, there's an EdTech makerspace happening, which we mentioned earlier in the hour. And these instructors and educators are identifying discrete digital skills and identifying gaps in the digital skills library to fill those gaps. And as we mentioned at the top of the hour, we invite you to help fill those gaps as well through an open crowdsourcing of resources. If you missed that, it'll be in the slide deck. The link to do that is at the beginning of the slide deck. The good news for you is that from January to June of 2022, we will be sharing the findings from the landscape scan. And Allison and I get the honor of starting to share some of that information with you today. We will also have in fall of 2022, a pilot, technical assistance pilot. And we also um, going down the road in 2022 to 2023, have some resource dissemination. This initiative ends in 2024. So there's a lot of resources coming. So look out for them. So this is the, mean, the meat of our presentation. That was an intro. Now we're gonna share some top instructional strategy findings, some best practices and resources from the DRAW project. Um, I still teach, I always find value in teaching and any way that we can expand our capacity as instructors to do better is always welcomed in my book. And so we hope that today as we share this information, these strategies that you see on the screen, very briefly, um, but we will also share some resources. We hope that it can inform your instruction moving forward. So I'm gonna turn it over to Allison now. Thanks, Jamie. So we are going to present um, from looking at a combination in our landscape scan and research um, what we saw in in research that goes back decades as well as like fresh um, practices that are found to be effective right now as we're all shifting the way we teach as technology continues to change um, one of the things we've known for years and there's researchers on our, our Zoom today who, who can speak to this, such as my colleague Jen Vanek and Kathy Harris, but that 
teaching foundational digital skills and actually any adult or basic education skill is done best in a real authentic context that the learners um, can both feel comfortable in, they understand the context in which they're learning and build upon that, but also where they see the relevance in their lives and have true authentic opportunities to practice them. So whether we're teaching English or literacy or math, we, we always wanna look for those opportunities for project-based learning and, and other ways to make it, or workplace instruction or ways to make um, learning authentic and real. Um, it also motivates students. Like some, maybe someone ends up, comes into our classroom to be, because they wanna learn English, but they're motivated in that way, but that's the way we loop them into caring about digital skills because technology is a way to practice English. Um, we also saw in our landscape scan, and, and I won't go into detail on why, the research as to why, but there's great resources that we'll be sharing out more, um, as well as on the LINCS um, website, which is linked here on how to teach skills that matter, you know, skills that matter being critical um, thinking, communication skills, navigating systems, self-awareness. It's the same model there, there of as we're teaching other content areas, um, that we make sure to embed those skills into our instruction and not try to teach them separately as discrete things in a, you know, in, in, in some abstract context. We also really found that if we want to make digital skills development opportunities available for a million more adults in the United States, that we need to embed it into our instruction of other skills, because otherwise, you know, students that might, I, I mentioned this before, but only be interested in some other topic area, how do we get them the opportunity to get interact, internet access, start to use the internet and develop even higher level digital skills? So as an ESL teacher, I've said for many years, you know, if, if I have only six or 10 or 12 hours with a student, how can I improve their life, life the most? Is it, is it teaching English for, for 12 hours or can I actually use that time to also onboard them to using technology? Um, there are great resources. Um, on how to do this. We've already mentioned the EdTech Integration Strategy Toolkit that helps teachers develop routines, like how might you use Quizlet regularly or slide decks or interactive um, technologies for students to communicate with each other. Even if it's just texting, you know, how can you do that or WhatsApp? How do you do that regularly to build student skills, but as you're teaching another um, content area? And we're really excited that with our Crowded Learning Initiative, there'll be ways to combine in playlists an open educational research that's meant to teach one topic area with another. So if you're teaching financial education and those concepts, you can then add into a personalized playlist an instruction on the digital skills to do banking or create a budget like slides, or sorry, like, um, like sheets and Googles or Excel. And so you'll be able to create personalized playlists that, that combine different skills. And we find that so important for this per contextualization and embedding. And again, check out the resources on the slide at links and teaching skills that matter. Now for um, the other piece is, we know that to engage many more learners in, in developing uh, digital, wanting to develop their digital skills, as well as giving them authentic opportunities, we have to understand much better what their interests and needs are. And this came up again and again in our research. Um, none of this is, is new to you, but I think we often hear learner-centered, lifelong learning, um, the need for digital skills. We also want to just emphasize the life-wide, look at all aspects of someone's life and where they might need digital skills or, or other adult basic skills, and really kind of widen are thinking about where our learners can engage in the skills. And the reason for that, which is um, has sort of shifted the way I think about teaching, is the research that Steve Reeder and others have done on practice engagement theory that looked at, you know, what is the, one of the biggest um, indicators of student success in developing new foundational skills, and this is on adults, and it wasn't necessarily the time they sit in a formal classroom. The, one of the biggest indicators was their change in practice outside of class. Like what, how much has a student changed 
how they're acting outside of class. So with English, if you're an ESL teacher like me, you understand that if my students not practicing, they're not going to develop as quickly. This needs to be applied to digital skills and every other instruction. And so um, what we need to think about is as teachers, what can I do in my classroom that will actually get my student comfortable, the, the foundational skills they need, but the comfort to actually be practicing every day in their life. And so how we do that, how we apply it to their needs and goals, um, I think we all know this, but we just wanted to share some particular um, resources in the, about the end of the slide deck, but some a needs assessment and a self-assessment for learners that have been created, emphasize that we try to build in choice for learners in our classroom so they can focus on the digital skills that are most um, valuable and immediate to their needs. Um, and there's another resource on how, what are ways you can embed digital skills into your instruction of other resources to get them practicing digital skills all the time. And there's a slide deck we learn by doing um, that we shared as well. So the next one is asset based. Um, and, and while there are needs in our learners, it's clear that they have skills um, that can support the development of digital resilience. Our learners are very resilient. There is, however, a lot of deficit thinking, not only by instructors, but also by learners. And in adult learning theory, we talk about drawing from one's knowledge, a principle that's effective with adult learners. And this should not be um, ignored when facilitating the development of learners' digital literacy skills and resilience. In order to teach with an asset-based approach, the instructor, excuse me, must evaluate the lens being used when teaching. Are there biases that impact our perspective of our learners? Are we using deficit-based language in our classrooms that perpetuate a false perception of how a diverse workforce strengthens society? Also, we can use peer-to-peer -peer learning. So we, we, ad we address our thinking and our lens as instructors. And then we also can use these strengths with peer-to-peer -peer learning. It's a tool that instructors can use to allow learners to share what they already know. And as Allison mentioned earlier, there is a self-assessment and self-assessments are a great way to start to see what learners already know. I know in assessment sometimes, we just look at what's wrong. <laughs> but how about we look at what they do know and acknowledge that and look at the assets of our learners. There's a question I have for you that will be placed in the chat. Over the last few years with the pandemic, we've seen a lot of things that our learners have accomplished. And one question I have is what digital literacy elements or skills have you seen in your learners over the last two years? There's another one that what are some deficit based language that you've seen in adult education. Uh, but I'm curious for you to shout out and celebrate your learners. What skills have you seen that your learners have and you can put that in the chat. We'll take a look at that in a moment. The next area is differentiated and targeted instruction. So adult learners, as you know, come with a wide variety of skills because of their background and experience. Adult learners can, however, benefit from um, differentiated and targeted instruction and focuses, focusing on the growth of specific needs and skills. So what is differentiated instruction? Uh, the process of identifying students' individual learning strengths, needs, interests, and adapting lessons to match them. Sometimes we look at the needs only based on proficiency and educational background and other areas, which is important, but also adapting lessons to the interests of our learners is also effective. And when we talk about targeted instruction, um, we're looking at it being personalized to address, address specific gaps or needs faster after an assessment and identif identification of a gap. Since digital skills can be fragmented, learners can know a lot, but then have a key gap that can be quickly addressed and that uh, addressing that gap can really help them. And notice we're talking about all of these so quickly. 
each one of these could probably be a whole presentation. But this is just a little taste of some of what we found in the landscape scan. So the, the slide here is recycling skills, skill instruction, and also transferable skills. Um, and when we think about filling out forms online, that can be a part of school, it's also a part of health, work, and many other contexts. So the wider the variety of contexts in which an adult encounters a skill, the easier it is to transfer the skill to additional contexts. Not all learners will recognize where a previously learned skill might be useful in a new context. I have an example of this. Um, in a workplace, we had gotten a new copy machine and I actually sat close to the copy machine. And it was very interesting to watch um, adults try and figure out how to transfer skills from one copy machine to the other. And that might be, you might think of your own example of when this is true. It's the same for our adult learners. So as instructors, we want to model how one skill can be represented in various contexts so they can see those connections. Great. Thanks, Jamie. And I just want to call out the research by our colleague, Jen Vanek, who and others who, who looked at you know, learners that weren't taught intentionally to or given the opportunity to really see that skills transfer or practice that didn't necessarily know, you know, or have the framework to say if you bold in this program, you can find that same bold option in email or in a different place. Um, so, so important. With that, it's that same kind of flexible mindset and self efficacy of having the confidence to say, okay, wait a minute, maybe I have sort of navigated a similar platform in the past or or maybe you know because I can text I can figure out how to whatsapp like having that confidence to just try new technologies especially as they're ever changing is is such a critical competency and we need to move from digital discrete digital skills instruction which we found in our landscape scan is still happening a lot because teachers you know need support and this is the draw project but to learn how to teach more this, um, this digital resilience. And if you haven't sort of read our definition of digital resilience, um, we have put that in our Digital Us Re Coalition report where we worked with many colleagues to define what that is. Um, so then the question is, how do we teach us? This? this is something we are all figuring out. This digital resilience in the um, American Workforce Project will have us all working together and you know, that listserv, the digital equ uh, equity and learning listserv is a place we're discussing this. But one thing we know is we already talked about explicitly teaching how to transfer skills. Um, Jeanette spoke about modeling the problem solving, you know, asking the class, hey, if, if we want to accomplish this, what technology should we teach? And, and if you haven't read um, coming out of the, the links and, and other resources, um, instructions on how to teach problem solving in a, in a technology rich environment. There's a link there we'll be sharing of um, our colleagues writing less, lesson plans for how do you develop in your classroom the thought of, okay, we wanna accomplish this online. How do we walk learners through? What technology are they gonna choose to use? Let's try using it. Is it working? Should we try something else? It's, it's that productive sort of struggle and failure that we also need to work in. Um, and sh both model for our learners, but also kind of facilitate opportunities where they're going to come up and try things and then fail and say, that's absolutely okay, let's try something else. And I think often when we're teaching more discrete skills, because we as educators ourselves are scared to be in, an, in a sort of create an opportunity for learners to go off and find things that we don't even know how to use. Um, it, sometimes it's our own fear to set up those more open environments that prevent us from creating and modeling that that process. Um, I want to also flag the idea of lifelong learning and, and creating people to be confident of, as lifelong learners of our own digital skills, because we're going to have to keep keep improving them as technology changes, is there's a, a great um, learning action plan to help learners come up with their own learning goals what they want to improve in. And there's an example our colleague, um, Rachel Riggs made for a digital literacy, like digital, like learning plans learners can help create and teachers can give feedback to learners on. Um, I just want to, for productive struggle and failure, I think just to be very specific, 
I think it's it's in the project based learning. It's it's saying, OK, you know, it's September. I, I work with janitors in California a lot. Like we want to sign our like make sure and help ex students sign their child up for soccer. Like what are what are kind of the websites? Let's research the websites in our in our community. Like let's try to do it. Where are we getting stuck? Who can help each other? And it, and it also gives opportunity for peer peer based learning. I'll stop there. Oh, and I see a question. Yes, we absolutely have to teach discrete skills because people need opportunity. They need to have the the base the ability to go out and practice and be successful, right? We don't want to set people up for failure. Of course, Adam. Thank you for that. I think um, we see that happening a lot, and it's something we as teachers are are confident. And I think we're really good at that. I think the landscape stand showed areas where we really need to improve to develop learners who are confident of learning new skills as opposed to kind of reliant on an instructor like oh that that changed i mean i i can't tell you how often i go to my dad <laughs> for help when it actually i could have figured it out like we're all doing the same thing at times and, and we need some basic skills but we also need to be pushed to to teach ourselves there was another question about some examples of deficit language and I recently saw an article, and I have to find it, about calling adults low skilled. Um, it's something we use often, but our learners are skilled in many ways. And so maybe we can learn how to phrase some of these words and that acknowledges what they do bring, what they do have. Um, and that's one example I just saw, and I have to find the article because I saw it earlier this week. Um, I'm sure that we all can think of ways that we ourselves have, have maybe used a word that doesn't acknowledge the assets of our learners. And so having a consciousness of this um, is the start. Um, even in, pre in preparing the slide deck, I had asset-based learning above differentiated and targeted instruction. And as I started thinking of what I was going to say, I was like, ooh, that's a little deficit language there. I need to reframe it and change how I phrase it. So thank you, Jen, for adding that in the chat. So on the screen, you will see again a little bit of the timeline for the digital resilience in the American Workforce Project. Um, there is a project page and a lot of the content um, that we will provide for the findings of the scan, you'll be able to locate it on the Links Federal Initiatives page for the DRAW project. We've also um, included two slides with some of the resources that have been added in the chat as Allison and I have been presenting. And so you'll have access to that in the post event email.